thanks, Arista. Uh, 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 I'm really glad and really happy that you are with us today. So we are here today at the uh, TechEd Cafe, which is part, from, uh, part uh, of uh, TechEd, is a tech community that supports Centred in its fight of uh, the poverty uh, in the Great uh, Montreal, uh, Great of Montreal. Uh, we started, uh, in fact, uh, five, uh, four or five years, uh, months ago, uh, when COVID started. It's an initiative from uh, Shival Mohad, and the goal is to have a place for the tech community to talk about subjects they, they want to, to exchange, in fact, to virtually meet, and uh, also to uh, raise uh, awareness about uh, the challenge uh, of uh, local community, uh, especially with uh, the COVID. And uh, so smart people, smart discussion, and uh, to support uh, a good cause. And if you want to know more about uh, TechEd, is uh, techedmontreal.org. You can uh, um, contact us if you want to be involved. You can also, we have a link uh, to donate to uh, Centred. Uh, they need your support. Um, yeah, that's it. And the rules are very open uh, for the Ticket Cafe. Uh, Alistair is here to, uh, to share his uh, knowledge to uh, enlighten us. Uh, but it's a really open discussion. And uh, I let know um, Alistair runs the show. Thanks. Thank uh, and hi, Gina. Wait, I saw Gina and then she vanished. Uh, my friend Gina is calling in from the southern US. There, is that her? Oh, we got other people joining. I think Gina's going to be a chair. Hi, Sherry. From Texas. Uh, there. From te Hi, Gina. How are you? So good hey, to I'm see good. you. Good to see you, too. This is Nason nice International. I think David Boyle may join us from England, too. We'll see what happens. So, uh, yeah, my name's Alistair. Some of you know me. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, we're going to do things. I have some international people that joined. Fait qu'on va se débrouiller en anglais, mais si vous avez des questions, je peux les répondre en français. Je suis Montréalais moi-même. Um, and I just wanted to talk about events. Uh, it's been a weird year, and we have some some fun things we're going to try and do, and I'm going to show you all some tricks. Uh, and then we can talk about whether the end of the world is about to happen to us, which is a more depressing thing. Um, the first thing I want to do, though, and I'm going to explain why I'm doing this later, um, I am uh, using a couple of weird things about my setup. So if you can see my video on the screen right now, um, now you can see this TV, right? So I'm going to be, I'm going to be moving the, the video screens and the resolutions to make things work. Uh, there we go. And now you should see a thing that says, where are you today? So if you can go look at where I see the top of that, it says go to menti.com and use the code 52836098. So I want you to take out your phone or open up another tab. If you've disappeared, then we know that you, you closed the wrong window. But um, go to menti.com, menti.com, and then use the code 52 52836098. And you're going to be able to answer this and type in where you are today. And then as you answer it, we should see those things pop up. Um, it's menti.com and it's 52836098. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is that uh, it will become clear in a minute is that this is a really good way to get a sense of what people are doing using different tools. So right now what I'm using is a tool called Mentimeter, which I'll show you in a minute. But as people type in where they are, it will pop up on their screens and show me where they are as a tag cloud. Uh, and we have a pretty small group here, but this kind of thing is a great way to get people to actually like roll up their sleeves and tell, tell us something about themselves and start contributing. And that's one of the keys for any of these events. We're used to staring in rectangles all the time for work. And then when we quit work, we sit on our couch and stare at rectangles. And then we go to bed and we stare at some rectangles. And then we go to sleep and we wake up and we look at a rectangle that tells us what we're going to do the next day. And that's our lives right now, which sucks. And so um, getting people engaged, getting them to participate like this, getting people uh, to do something tangible is really, really useful. So this tool called Mentimeter, I've now moved to the next thing on that screen. Hey, David, how are you? Hey, good. So Sorry, we now have mate. Gina from Texas and David from England. There you go, Laurent. We got a lot of people for uh, Centre de Montreal. Uh, Laurent is the organizer of a nonprofit uh, or an organization that benefits a nonprofit. And we're doing a series of these tech cafe things. Uh, and this one's just a chance to talk about the future events. Um, so if you went to that uh, Mentimeter webpage, uh, you should be able to type in what are you hoping to learn today on that page? Um, and you will be able to 
uh, tell me the things that you want to learn in there. You can go ahead and type something in and it should just scroll by. And I'm, I'm doing this partly to show you something about events, all the stuff we're doing. What is Alistair up to now? Nobody wants to know that. Um, the, how to build an audience for an event. That is really hard to do. Um, my one rule for uh, an audience for an event is uh, you've got to build a community of people who trust you to spend their time wisely. Like the thing that we are all poor for right now is time. I look at my calendar and it looks like a, uh, a the end of a really good game of Tetris. All of us are more busy than we were before, which makes no sense because uh, other than Rag, uh, Ragad, who's actually driving in a car right now, um, we are not having to commute as much, so we should have lots of, of time. But right now, we're all here. We're looking at each other. As you've showed up, I've welcomed you. You're giving me some feedback. Uh, we've done things to interact and connect with one another. We've got some welcome friends. That changes the whole energy and perception of the thing. So uh, I want to ask you one more question, and then we're going to get some, uh, some thoughts on this stuff. How are you feeling about your career prospects, the reopening of schools, and the future of events? So I want you to tell me where you are on those three dimensions. So this tool that I'm using, uh, Mentimeter, it's a pretty simple tool, but already you can use it to get a little more sophisticated than just a basic poll. You start to see where people stand. It's kind of nice real-time feedback. This is kind of cute. You'll also notice that rather than sharing my screen and taking up the whole screen, I'm doing this in a little, I mean, I can switch back to just me uh, because I'm a total nerd. I can also, uh, you know, put myself in the corner like this while I'm talking to you um, because I don't like anybody telling me when I can or can't share my screen. Um, so people are pretty excited about their career prospects and not so much about the opening of schools. Uh, okay, so uh, here's what I want to do. By the way, I'm using a little tool called an ATEM Mini to do this, A10 Mini is a little tiny um, four channel HDMI switcher. You plug four HDMI things into it, you plug it into your computer, it looks like a webcam. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to toggle back and forth between different sources. Um, if I want to, I can get really cheesy and start doing wipes and stuff. Um, but little things like this can make your whole you know, presentation much more professional. So um, I wanna show you a few slides. And I'm gonna break my rule about slides by showing you slides because one of the most important things to do is not um, show slides a lot. Here's some things I think are important about the future of events. Uh, first of all, um, as some of you know, I broke my leg in a pretty bad, complicated way uh, by falling in a really stupid boomer fail kind of way. And uh, while that was uh, fine for a little while, my foot does now have a metal plate with nine pins in it. That was no fun. Um, I, had, I got to watch three episodes of Tiger King waiting for the ambulance to arrive. So now you, like in the COVID time, we know that was the Tiger King phase, right? So you know where this happened in COVID. It was like April, then it was June, then it was September. Those are the only months of COVID. Um, it got pretty bad. I had stitches in it. I'm sorry, I should give you a trigger warning. And then I spent a bunch of time studying the event tech industry because I run events, right? I, I speak for a living or I get other people together for a living. Uh, my list now has 218 rows. I literally have a spreadsheet. I've talked to about 40 CEOs of uh, tech companies at this point. Everything I wrote in May is probably wrong. <laughs> did a webinar in May, um, 827 people showed up. I was expecting nobody, that's fine. Uh, and then um, I think my conclusion at the end of all this is that we are in the middle of a Napster moment for our industry. Uh, when you look at the recording industry, when Napster came along, everything broke. The margins went away. It was no longer possible to own a physical record store and have record labels and all these other things in the traditional way. We stopped selling albums and started selling individual songs and remixes. The shows became a much more, and the merch became a more important part of economics. And eventually, 20 years later, we figured out that the business model for music was, not, was Spotify. And the same thing kind of happened in the movie theater industry, right? We had movies some movie got released yesterday and it was like in theaters and i thought in theaters where possible like can i get a face mask with my popcorn how does that work right um when theaters came along and then the web showed up netflix and hbo and disney plus were the end business model and so of course we are now in a world where the events industry showed up and then covid showed up and now we don't know what will be there but it ain't something like Mobile World Congress. It's something like Spotify or Netflix and nobody knows what it is yet. None of us, if you wanted to show up here and I knew what it is, we should be meeting on my yacht. I'm not that smart. And so um, we are in the middle of this weird Napster moment. 
And I didn't use this line. This is for an amazing article that came out very recently on Skift magazine called The Event Industry is Being Confronted by Its Napster Moment. But I think he's absolutely right. There are very few articles that I agree completely with. I agree completely with this article. And this should not be a secret because the event industry has sucked for a while. Um, many events that made money off trade show floors would rent square feet at $12 and sell them at $600 and sprinkle enough content to make the sponsors convinced that they were doing the right thing and paying enough money for that ridiculous markup because they were getting something called thought leadership, whatever the hell that was, that allowed their salespeople to have a boondoggle in New York City and get away from their husband or wife and kids for a while. In fact, I have a friend who shall remain nameless who regularly took trips to trade shows that didn't exist and he would go stay in a hotel for a few days just to get some peace and quiet. He wasn't having an affair, he just wanted peace and quiet. He's going nuts. Cause like his, his marriage was based on these fake trade shows. So psychologically, this is a terrifying thing, right? The emperor's clothes were already really thin in the event industry. In fact, the day that I broke my leg, O'Reilly, the company that runs Strata and so on, shut down its entire event business. One of the ways to think about this is that when an industry takes a benefit and turns it into a penalty, it dies. So the taxi industry used to be amazing, right? The taxi was a superpower. You wave your hand, someone picks you up on the street and takes you somewhere, and you don't even have to buy a car. That's pretty cool. And then it became, oh, your user interface is standing on the street in the rain, waving your arm, and if the driver likes the color of your skin, maybe they'll pick you up and take you somewhere and try and not get used the credit card because they want to pocket the cash and not declare the revenue. That's a lousy user interface. And so every time we start with something that looks good and then technology comes along and we don't pay attention to what's now possible, our benefit becomes a drawback. The same thing is true, you know, late fees were great because I don't have to take my movies back. Now late fees kind of suck because a late fee is basically a, ta a tax, right? I don't want a late fee, I want to stream my movie. And so when a technology shows up, it turns a benefit into a pain for the customer. And event customers just haven't realized yet that a lot of the things they thought were beneficial were the event industry resisting change because it got to make such great margins. It's one of the reasons I have said no to doing web-based events and streamed events many times. I don't like how it works. But this crisis is forcing us to confront that. So um, we did this already, but some of the things I've learned uh, are about engagement. And so this, I don't want you to go back to it again. I was thinking of jumping in here, but I figured we'd get started with that. There are lots of new tools and new ways to create engagement. We're all sitting here, some of us are driving cars, we're in three different countries, but we're connecting, we're having a conversation, that's fine. I'm having a bit of a monologue, so I should probably shut up for a little bit because one of the rules is no narrative slides. But the ability to make something feel like interactive like this is a big deal. Uh, hey, Gina, turn on your microphone. Sure, Alistair, what's up? How you doing, How you doing in Texas? I'm good, it's hot. Um... You're not going back to work at Dell, are you? No, 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 okay. <laughs> no. Do you have no. some big news to share with us today? Big news? Yeah, you were on Twitter. You were like, hey, I got some news. And then people were going, you're not going back to Dell, are you? I can't remember what I was even talking about. It had nothing to do with work, I don't think. <laughs> what was the last event you went to? Uh, I... I think the last event that I participated in was the Google Next event. Oh, nice. Uh, so if you were going to ask Kim a question, and you don't know Kim, what would you ask Kim? Kim, turn on your microphone for a second. Hi. Hi, Kim. Why don't you tell Gina who you are? Um, I'm Kim Valley. I'm from uh, in the Montreal area. And uh, I work as a consultant in innovation UX. But uh, also why I'm there is be here is because uh, I'm a want to do uh, a community for uh, kids. Uh, and so obviously we will need a little bit different tools because there's parental uh, um, and privacy, but uh, so that's why I'm here. And I used to be a lifestyle blogger. Uh, hey, Regat, if you got to go or you got to get out, we'll see you back later. Thanks for joining us, but yeah, we'll carry your phone around. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody say hi to Regat's daughter. Hi. 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 
<laughs> All right. Uh, so, Regina, if you wanted to, if you wanted to ask Kim one piece of one question about building a community for kids, what would it be? Wow. Um, wh what's the purpose of the community? Who are the kids? Um, it's, it's it started as a, a coding, you know, Minecraft stuff, but now it's more like a, Robo a Roblox. Because what I think it's more interesting is that from my background also is because there's uh, I'm a designer and an entrepreneur. So you, you can teach kids the game to, uh, you know, how to make games, make them also bring girls into it because, you know, I have a boy and he takes Minecraft courses and Unity courses. And sadly, there's, a, you know, there's not a lot of girls. And we need mm -hmm. girls in tech, yeah. and we need girls that think it's it's fun and does all different things that they can collaborate. And I think that as a platform, what I learned is that Roblox has already a lot of tools made it for it. So that's why, and it it will be for the nine to twelve years old. That awesome. sounds awesome. Uh, so there's two. I, I don't know everybody here, and we don't really have time to go around the room. But I want everybody to try something. So everybody open up your chat window. You should be able to do that at the bottom of the thing and you should be able to hit the word chat. If you haven't guessed already, I'm giving you a talk on running events by showing you a bunch of the stuff we do at events, which I will then explain why we did it and how the psychology works. Not that there's a big trick here. Um, go into the chat and type, I want everybody to think about what is the one thing you hope has changed in the world by the end of 2020? What is the one thing you think you hope has changed in the world by the end of 2020? Don't press enter. Type. Ah. Don't press enter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jeannie, you got to write something longer than my president. <laughs> Don't press enter. Sorry, I should have said that. That was the easy answer. We planned this ahead of time so nobody would just say presidential elections. Um, but uh, go ahead and everybody type in. It can be several sentences if you want. What's the one thing you really hope? that we experience as a society or that we change or we agree on by the end of 2020. Don't hit enter yet, Gina. So what's interesting about what we're doing right now is there's, a, there's a, a sense of shared work. We are all doing something. And now I want you all on the count of three, which is when I say the number three, I want you all to hit enter. And then we're going to read them, okay? One, two, three. Okay, so, I mean, it's, this is an interesting experience. Whenever I've done this with people, there's a sense of we created something and then we took time to reflect. And we weren't speaking except for maybe me, but we were all sharing a task. And that already feels more natural and more engaging than almost every webinar you've been to. And I didn't have to use any special technology. I just told people to type something and then pause and then take a moment to consume it. I changed the the pattern of communication so in this case the pattern was i'm going to create and then i'm going to get a response and we made it sort of asymmetric rather than real time which is kind of nice and we wrote some beautiful things so i'm going to show you all a couple of interesting things i've learned first of all and you can pin my screen if you want to see the fonts bigger but it's kind of nice to see everyone's faces um, you'll notice that a lot of what we're doing is based on human psychology uh, I think it's really important to recognize that we're in this sort of edutainment industry and our job is to engage people because if they're not engaged, they're not going to learn. Um, generally, when you have someone in an, in an activity, the best thing that works is intermittent positive reinforcement. The occasional, hey, how are you? It's great to see you. That was wonderful. Well done. Uh, setting expectations. If you watch a movie and it's a comedy, like if Adam Sandler's in it, it's probably not a science documentary, right? Nothing wrong with Adam Sandler. I like to watch him too, especially since the legalization of weed in Canada. Um, but, but you know, um, there is certainly an expectation that it's a talk show or a stand-up piece or a documentary or whatever. 
by now, all of you know that you might get called on. So you're all paying much more attention than you had been. You also know I'm going to do some weird screen trickery where I start to move things around and put myself in the picture and do strange stuff like that, right? And because of this, you're much more likely to keep paying attention. So there's intermittent positive reinforcement. We're having occasional interactions like this. You've got expectations. You already know this is going to be pretty casual. I got a couple of ringers on here, friends I haven't seen. It's always nice to see them joining us. Hi, Gina. Hi, David. Um, and also, you have a sense of what this is going to be like, right? It's going to be conversational. We're going to have a chance to talk. Uh, and you all know that you might get called on. So setting those expectations is huge. If you know me, you know I love threes. Uh, I once drew a thing on a wall of a toilet in LA, and it's still there. I was allowed to draw on the wall that said, can, will, uh, can, should, and will. And then the middle said must. And if you did can and should, but not will, it's lazy. Can and will, but not should, it's naughty. And then should and will, but not can, it was learn. And in the middle was yay, right? I love trifectas like this. So I'm going to show you a few of these trilogies that I think everybody needs to use as a checklist for live events. And I keep doing these things on live events, and I have yet to use all the same slides. So at some point, there's enough of them. But I think every event has to have three things. There has to be something you do. We just created this thing in the chat together where we wrote and we built something together. We used that Mentimeter tool to tell one another what we were feeling. There's something we're sharing, which is Gina is now talking to Kim about a community for kids and coding. That was communication and collaboration that you didn't know was going to happen. And there's something you learn. Hopefully, I'm giving you some content. And if you check all those three boxes, people will feel it's time well spent. If you just do one of them, you're missing the point. Um, we also have postures that tend to come naturally to us in this case. Uh, something you do or collaboration, we tend to do in front of a keyboard, which is our natural place to be consuming most of this content. When we want to communicate, we generally pull out our phone and we talk to people, right? So that's a very different kind of model. Um, and then if we want to learn, we often, when we're consuming content, just sit and stare at a big screen. Hey, Claude, how are you? Fine. Nice to see you. Hello, everybody. Um, so when you're trying to um, put together a conference, think about the postures that we naturally assume for, commu for communicating, collaborating, and, and uh, consuming. If you're running an event and you have a bunch of keynotes, why not let people stream them on their TV using Chromecast? That's why I like to watch stuff, right? And then they can communicate using their phone in their hand. Way more natural. Plus, they're not going to hit Alt-Tab and go do something else. I think every conference needs to have tactile, visual, and auditory components. So I want to try something right now. Everybody who's on the screen, I want you to uh, take your hand, and I want you to tell me on a level, on a scale of like 1 is down here to 10 is up here, I want you to use your hand and show me on a scale of 1 to 10 how, hap how much are you enjoying the content so far. And it's okay to say not at all because I, I can handle that. i got a thick skin. So, so that's great. I, I love that you're all doing this. Luke is, Luke is like, yeah, but I like that. Luke is honest and the rest of you not so much. Okay, put your hands down. So the one thing we just did is we all moved our hands, right? We did something kinesthetic. Something else that I did on a call the other day, I was like, well done. Everybody give yourselves a pat on the back. So everybody give themselves a pat on the back right now. Go ahead. And you know what's funny is in COVID times, people do this like awkwardly long. They're like, oh man, I miss the touch of human contact. <laughs> but tactile works. Giving people something tactile like that helps a lot in terms of making them remember it. Something visual, we all saw this thing go up and down. At the beginning, if you hadn't showed up, you'd be like, hey, please turn on your screens. I've even done stuff where I'm like, okay, everybody with blue eyes, turn off your screen, uh, turn off your camera. Now everybody with brown eyes, turn off your camera. Well, guess what? At the end of it, everyone's got their cameras on. That was a neat trick, right? And then auditory stuff, play music before the event starts. So these are all things that make a huge difference to how engaged people are. Because as humans, those are very important things. I can't spray smells down your, your computer, fortunately. But everything else works just fine. Um, there's another rule. I think every event is either a talk show, a game show, or the Rocky Horror Picture Show. What I mean by that is that if you're a talk show, if you're a game show, like The Price is Right, your goal in the, in the game show model is you have a small local audience, but they're there to entertain the larger audience. So you may have a few people in a small area, it's socially distanced, it's a small group. It makes the presenter feel more alive. I don't have to sit here and stare at a camera and pretend you're all right there. But it also uh, gives you some feedback. But when you watch The prices, right, the people in the audience are there for the entertainment of the people at home. It's not about their entertainment, right? So that's the kind of game show mindset. The second one is really a talk show approach. 
And you've seen people take interesting approaches to this. I love this picture of Jimmy Kimmel talking to Tracy Jordan, who's on a computer screen in front of him. So it's not two people on a screen, it's Jimmy in his homeroom. But the idea of a talk show is you bring on a guest, maybe they show a clip from their latest movie, but it's back and forth conversation with surprise guests. And then the third format is really the Rocky Horror Picture Show. If you haven't seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show, you have no reason to go see it. It's not that exciting. But there's no point to watching it recorded. The reason people watch the Rocky Horror Picture Show is to go see crazy people who are dressed up funny throw things at the screen. So if someone's going to give a talk that you can see elsewhere that's pre-recorded, there better be something exciting or new about it. That person better be in the chat room or they're doing a mashup or like I've seen people do all kinds of interesting stuff. My, my current project is I want to do a choose your own adventure talk where I do a part of the talk and then I do a poll and say, if the audience wants to learn about this, do this. If the audience wants to learn about this, do this and go choose your own adventure branching talks. Why? Because I don't have enough time to sleep and I want to try all kinds of new stuff. But that's a cool idea, right? And so when you start to think about this as a new thing instead of a different thing, when you start to think about not what we've lost, but what's now possible, you start to find really cool things we can do. Here's another trilogy I like to think about a lot. Um, there tend to be three formats within live events. There's one person talking to a very large number of people, and usually that's a keynote that's streamed through something like YouTube Live or Twitch at scale. There's like a 20 second delay between me speaking and someone hearing it, so there's very little chance for real interaction. Then there's breakouts. Breakouts are a few people speaking to many. Uh, you've probably seen things like Zoom webinars, uh, Click Meeting, Big Marker. Those are other tools that do that. And then there's workshops, which is like lots of people in a room and everybody can talk to everyone else. Doesn't scale so well, very interactive. Generally, conferences have those three formats. Some are one to, one to many and some are many to many interactions. So having seen this stuff, there's a few patterns that I've seen emerge. Uh, we ran, some of you may have seen this, we ran Startup Fest in Montreal. Uh, I am very on brand in my hot pink shorts. Uh, David was actually supposed to be here for Startup Fest, but can't be here and he's in London right now. Um, so I talked about you on that. About that? Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so about, I hope you were making fun of my shorts. So we did this in the old port of Montreal. We had about 30 people in the audience, a socially distanced audience. And then we had this screen. These are some of the Startup Fest judges and I'm watching the judges. So the fact that you're seeing me watch other people Human psychology says you're going to watch what that guy's watching. And also, if one of those videos has a delay, it doesn't matter because I'm not buffering. The video I'm watching is buffering. So we changed some things there. This is our grandmother judges. We recorded these using a tool called StreamYard. Um, StreamYard is a way for many people to come into uh, a recorded room and then broadcast that thing out. Uh, so here is um, you know, one of our people, the grandmother judges we have, who, by the way, our grandmother judges have a better investment record than any VC, which makes me incredibly happy. They are ruthlessly good at judging this. And then when we had conversations, uh, this is me interviewing Lenny Wachitsky. I'm looking at the screen with Lenny on it, but next to me, you can see an LED screen that has me and the other speaker. And so if Lenny's video gets slow, it doesn't matter. It's just Lenny's video in the bigger picture. Now, a setup like this costs a lot of money. This is high production value. But we tried to put many of the things that we learned from this lesson into it. If you're doing a little less, <clears throat> we've been recording a series of events with Georgian partners. Um, this is Teresa Johnson from Airbnb, my co-host down the bottom left, Navdeep Martin and Amy Heineke from Primer, and Joseph Sarash, who's the CTO of Compass. He was the head of all data at Microsoft. Like, he ran that and reported to Satya and before that AWS. So this is... One of the nice things is I can't get these people to return my calls. I have the head data scientist and product manager at Airbnb, the founder and head of product for a company that basically makes science fiction stuff Jack Bauer wishes he had, uh, and the former head of data at, at uh, Microsoft who's now reinventing the real estate industry. I can get him on a phone for an hour, and we had a great time. This was a really fun conversation. It was informal. We record these things. We broadcast them out. Um, people join and we bring them on stage to ask questions so they feel like they're part of it, right? So um, we've been doing things virtually that work pretty well. But one of the key rules is we try really hard to be surprising. Um, we, you know, when you watch an Avengers movie, you stick around until the end credits because something weird is going to happen. So now you're all wondering what I'm going to do that's weird in this call. Uh, changing your video backgrounds. I did something the other day to mess with people. Uh, I was in my apartment. I put, I, I put on photo booth. You can all try this trick. It's really funny. I put on photo booth. 
I pressed record without me in front of my computer, just an empty chair. And then a few minutes later, I went and made some tea in the background with a big red cup. And then I walked around the back of my table and brought the red cup and came into the frame and put it down. And then I pressed pause and I saved the video. And then I went to Zoom and I changed my Zoom background to that video. And then I started talking my talk and about three minutes into the talk, Alistair appears over my shoulder and makes a cup of tea and I don't say anything. And people are like, aren't you gonna talk about the elephant in the room? And I said, who are you calling an elephant? Went on with my talk. A couple of minutes later, big red cup shows up. I look up and say, thank you to myself. And then I pick up the cup that I've staged there, have a sip of tea and continue. And people are like, what just happened? But I guarantee you they were paying attention to the rest of my talk. What are you going to do that makes people go, I got to pay attention because I'm going to miss the joke. Um, physical artifacts. We value what's, what's, uh, what's scarce. And what's scarce right now is physical contact. So mailing things to people, even if that's just stuff they can like hang on to and wave around. I have, I, I have weird stuff in my background. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs here that some people have found, like a little jacuzzi hand, right? For no good or convincing reason other than I think that's a funny thing to have in your background. But like, what are you doing that's going to mess with people? I have a... A Rick and Morty synthesizer, if you look carefully. Um, no, really, it's a, it's a tiny little Rick and Morty synthesizer. What kind of Easter eggs are you putting in your background? What are you doing that surprises people? What can you send to people that makes them feel part of a community? These are all interesting things as well. Um, I've been cataloging different formats that work well. Uh, we run a conference every year called BitNorth. That's basically a conference I run for friends. Uh, two of you have been there. Woo, BitNorth. Yeah, everybody go get your BitNorth mugs. Uh, but I want to do... Um, basically a an open mic night so everybody comes and suggests their talk in the chat and then we do a poll and we vote and the talks that get the most upvotes that person just goes and gives their talk right away why not right there's so many formats um confessional formats where everyone changes their name turns off their camera and then confesses to like their biggest dumbest startup mistake um Oxford debates where there's two people on the left and two people on the right and a moderator in the middle and you pull the audience to say who do you agree with over the course of the day. There's so much potential for things we couldn't do before. So I'm excited about this because like this is the model that gave us the Spotify's and the Netflix's is thinking what could we now do. Um, I've broken the rule here by not having by having by saying no narrative slides but I'm trying to make this fairly interactive and pop back in and out and ask questions you got to avoid narrative slides. You can't just sit there and give a slide deck. But you do also have to remember from a business standpoint that that person who's in your event is always in the checkout line. They could buy a book or back a Kickstarter or buy a cup of coffee right now. Laurent, do you want to tell people how they can buy a cup of coffee to benefit Centraide? I set that up for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, they can simply pledge uh, for, uh, for a donation like... Uh, uh, if they want to pledge by email or by Twitter uh, with a hashtag uh, a Ticket Cafe, say, I uh, would like to uh, uh, take a Grande Cafe and, and $10 uh, donation, or go on our website, uh, ticketmontreal.org, uh, and uh, you have uh, the right corner, corner uh, donate to Centre link. And, uh, can, you, can you paste the link to that in the chat so everyone knows? Yes. So um, calls to action matter a lot because we should have a thing in here that says, do this thing. I was trying out a product called rally.video that does meetings for up to 35 people. You can break out into different tables. One of the things I love about rally is you can hear the people at the other tables as a murmur. Like you can actually hear those other conversations happening, which feels more natural. Right? This is all about human psychology. Um, I think I'm going to skip a couple of these things. One of the trends I'm seeing now is there's more and more customization of the stage. So there are now uh, apps that will let you build your virtual stage. There's also things like mm -hmm, that let you put something to your side. Not everybody is going to go out and buy, you know, their, their A10 mini because they're not nerds like me. But there are software tools that will let you do some of this stuff better uh, without a lot of production. Um, these are some of the tools I was talking about. This is Rally. The Rally video is in the top corner here where it says uh, your table. Uh, and then there's uh, there's another one called Yo Tribe, which has little circles, and when you walk next to other circles, video pops up so you can talk. Uh, there's Air Meet, which makes it look like a bunch of uh, tables at recess. I, I always have a problem with these because it triggers my PTSD from childhood, where I don't want to sit at a table by myself, and I also don't want to walk up to the cool kids and have them go, "Sorry, uh, you can't sit here." 
Uh, so I like Yotri, but, but there are many to many networking tools that feel much more natural. Uh, there are group activities. You saw Mentimeter earlier. Uh, Mentimeter is this basically this thing on the left, and, and what Mentimeter does is it just looks like a slide deck. And so you put your little slides in. Over on the right is a tool that's currently under construction, and it's called um, docs.plus. It's being built by Newspeak House, and it's a very reduced functionality word processor. It's actually built on something called Etherpad. But, oh, that's nice. Pledging five bucks plus one dollar for each person who pledges, pledges an amount. That's awesome. You know, this could, this could get recursive pretty fast. Um, so when you look at this thing like Docs Plus, um, yeah, Hopin is pretty good. I didn't li list uh, Hopin code because it tries to be much more than that. It tries to be a full conference app as well, yeah. and it has very little control over the management of the rooms. Um, like I said, I got 219 rows. It's very hard to categorize anything. AirMeet has gone from being a meeting platform to more stuff than that now too. Um, so, uh, tech, so Docs Plus is a Google Doc, but every time you create a heading, it creates a chat room. So if you're working on a doc with a bunch of people, you can go in and click on the little image and all of a sudden there's a chat room there and you'll show up as video. So all of these are just examples of the kinds of things people are doing in the same way that Microsoft went and attached internet to everything in Windows 95. We're now attaching video to everything. So every task you do say, how could I put a video here? And how could I have other people join me? Don't forget, 20 years ago, we didn't have Google Docs. We, the idea of working on a Word doc together was foreign. Now we just take it for granted that we can all go edit it together, right? That's gonna happen with video very soon. So um, I've burned through way more than the 10 minutes I said I would, but I would like to discuss the following things. Uh, what do you think is the Netflix or Spotify of events? What are you cutting? Because when the margins evaporate and the margins are gone from our industry, people are, I think pretty stupidly, giving away tickets for free because they think that that's how you get people to attend. I don't attend events because they're free. I attend events because they're interesting. Like, and I'll pay if they're interesting and I trust the person to use my time wisely. I don't go to, I don't attend an event because it's free. There's tons of things that are free right now that I'm not at. All we do by cutting the price of tickets to zero is we take money out of the mouths of people who are spending good time doing useful things that deserve to be paid for it. I've had two people ask me to run conferences for them. Both of them said, they'll pay me a lot of money. And I said, yeah, what's my speaker budget? Oh, we can't pay speakers. I said, I'm not doing it. And then finally I got a third one and they said, we'll pay you this much. I said, you pay me less, but you give me two, $3,000 US speaker fees and I'll go find some speakers. They're like, okay. It's my job as an event organizer to keep the money where it belongs, which is in the hands of the content creators who are doing good work. Because someone who was making money on renting real estate space, that person, they had, a, they had a scam anyway. They weren't really adding a lot of value. And so I, I literally almost shut down a conference in New York because I tried to move a chair from the floor to the stage to make room for another panelist. And the union boss threatened to shut down the Jacob Javits Center. That's not a business value. And I have no problem with that dying a slow, painful, horrible death. But you got to ask yourself, what are you cutting? Because the middlemen are vanishing. There isn't room for the talent scout and the record store label and the breakage fee. The music industry used to charge breakage fees for when the CD or the record broke. Did you know that MP3s include a breakage fee? And that money goes to the label? That's bullshit. If we're going through that Napster moment, what are we cutting? The biggest shift that's happening right now is that we're moving from atoms to bits. And atoms were great because they got us all in one place and we had everyone's attention for three days and they went home. Now that we're digital, I didn't get to the trade show, check in on my flight, book the hotel. If I don't like what I'm doing, I can go home. It's a sunk cost. My ticket, if it was free, is a sunk cost and I can just leave. If my ticket was paid, no one's going to know I didn't go. I didn't go watch movies for three hours, right? And so the reality is I can leave with a click. But I can also join with a click. I talked to the organizer of a very large conference two weeks ago. He said they had 20, 26,000 people signed up when the conference opened. How many people do you think 
were online at the end of the first day. I want you to type it into chat. In the morning, they had 26,000 signups. It was a free event. How many people were online at the end of the first day? See, you're all pessimistic. The answer is 52,000. Because I can join without booking travel. So people told them this event is amazing and their friends joined. They doubled attendance. No conference organizer has ever thought about the fact that you can sell tickets because it's one click to join. The best time to sell tickets may be when the thing starts. Who was it? Okay, Gino, it was the Financial Times. They ran a big FT, save the world from COVID and climate change thing. Al Gore was there. I mean, they had great speakers, but they went from 52, uh, 26,000 to 52,000 people. We're thinking bring, about this wrong. Bring Al Gore. Well, yeah, bring Al Gore, that's great. I'm not saving the world the way he is, but it's still true. But the underlying idea here is what new business models are possible because Google went from a three-day conference to a nine-week conference. That's a media company. That's a subscription. I'm not selling you a ticket. I'm selling you a content subscription. And so those business models are changing dramatically. So um, as you can probably guess, I've got lots and lots of thoughts on these subjects. Those are the ones I happened to have today. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. If you just came here to see that list and you want to go, that's fine. If you want to stick around and talk, uh, turn on your mics and let's hear a cacophony. But the questions I would like to know the answers to, um, and I will leave them up with me in a little window on the side because I like showing off my technology, um, is, are these. So who, David, I'm going to pick on you since you're a familiar face. What do you think the event industry, so for context, <laughs> Uh, David ran analytics at EMI, the BBC, Masterclass, and Harrods, among many other things, and spent some of his time this summer um, putting together a data science course for kids using the works of Katy Perry to teach people about statistics. So he is a remarkable person. Um, you should all follow him everywhere. Um, and uh, David, you have had an experience seeing the music industry get decimated um seeing masterclass produce paid content what do you think the events industry will look like in in five or ten years when this shakeout has happened yeah well that's a great great analogy by the way the music industry and there's so many horrible lessons to learn from it but um i think you're absolutely right on thinking about what the core value add is and you know the value add isn't breakage so don't rely on breakage but the value add was finding really, really great talent and helping them to produce something, content, that really was very good, songwriting or production values maybe, but helping great people to produce great content and then finding a way to get it to people, that is still needed in this world. And even the, the best independent artist still needs that. And if record labels could reinvent themselves to deliver that, they would be successful instead of relying on old economic streams and I work with a lot of different conferences and I think the same thing is true like find great people who really have something to say that's hard by the way don't just sign up people who spoke at other conferences but find great people you really believe in like help them to produce great content don't just put them in a speaking slot and give them an hour but like help them to produce something great for that hour with some of the tips we've heard today and then build a brand and do some marketing to help people to discover that, that great content. And for me, at the heart of events, it's something like that. And I've worked with big, like paid for-profit events companies that, that do all the things Alistair said. They don't do any of those things. They don't try to find good talent. They don't try to create great content. And they don't work very hard to put it in front of people. But I think that if you do those things, you're gonna be in a great place. So the question is how, which is what I'm looking for here. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the, the point of being able to curate that content, I remember years ago, I found a woman who had moved here from Iran and did her PhD in uh, using AI to extract human emotion from images to help kids with autism. And today, that woman is Rana El Kayubi. She got on stage at Strata. We spent weeks on her talk. She got on stage at Strata and this guy from the Atlantic who was there to write about data science just wound up doing a 12-page expose on her. Now she's famous enough that like she's told her assistant to reply to me politely 
And I said to her when she got off stage, I was like, someday I hope you remember me because you're wonderful and I would like to talk to you again in five years, but you're going to be too busy. And she laughed, but that's exactly the case. She's published a book and, she, and but that feels amazing. She's a person who had great ideas. She's delightful. She works crazy hard. And if you can find those diamonds in the rough and you have a reputation for doing so, that is an amazing currency. And I think it's, it's very, it takes a lot of work. Um, but I think we need to do a lot of design thinking. Like, why would anybody go to a thing just because it's free? That to me is a sign that it's worth even less. I think, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I, I think another thing is um, now you have this opportunity for people to go to events that were never able to afford it before. So, you know, of, of course, I work for, I've always worked for big vendors and um, the first event I was allowed to go to, even though I wrote tons and tons of content for it, um, we ran a contest, we did a whole bunch of things. It was way, way early days of social media, but I insisted that we had a contest and we did develop content for people who couldn't be there in person because they would watch everything online. And now like, you know, it's just like 10 years later, being online is so much different than it was before. And so you can find these crazy, amazing people that are tucked into places that you would have never ran into them before because they couldn't afford to travel. So, I mean, that, I think designing for those people. Yeah, real, well, we're too. doing this this thing we're running, the digital government thing we're running in, in November called Forward 50. Um, we have decided that we will make two tickets free to any municipality, state, provincial, or territorial government. So we're only charging national governments. And there, last time I checked, there's 195,000 municipalities. But we decided, and, and we think the content speaks for itself, so I'm breaking my own rule about free, but this is a chance for us to go, hey world, this thing happens, would you like to be a part of it? We get to build it, and next year we say, look, 70 countries joined, you know, 500 municipalities, whatever. But, but I, every regional government I talk to, there's somebody working away, they're the person that's building forms or spreadsheets or trying to get people to use a password manager. They're like the true believer in tech. And, I, and I've had them tell me, um, hey everybody, you are, um, you know, you're fighting the right fight. And they said, when they come to these events, they're like, I'm not alone, I'm not insane. Yeah. So how do you not, uh, the event is called FWD 50. It's uh, now the world's largest digital government conference. Um, and I should, I will paste the thing in here. We um, haven't announced the uh, regional ticket initiative. We're going to announce that next week, but uh, yeah, it's a big deal. That it has become the world's biggest digital government conference. This year, I have the uh, the a member of Facebook's Supreme Court. Did you know Facebook has a Supreme Court? They have a Supreme Court, and the, the Danish government has an embassy to them. So, at what point do we just say Facebook's a nation, and then it's foreign interference in elections? <laughs> there you go, Gina. <laughs> yes, we have the. Uh, would, do you have any questions for the uh, for a member of Facebook Supreme Court who is a lawyer in Brazil who took on Bolsonaro? Um, so hopefully he's safe and still around by the time November rolls around. But uh, yeah, interesting times. Um, where what do you think is going to get cut in the like supply chain that exists for these things? What do you think is going to get cut the most? Oh wait, hang on. What do you think will get cut in the traditional events model? Food, venues, booking, and trade shows. And yeah, the trade show exhibit floor, sure. Food, beverage, yep. Yeah. Terrible speakers will just get zero people after the first one minute, and it'll be obvious that they were, they were never sustainable. But, well, one of the things I've realized is that all of us who speak for a living have three times as much free time. So I used to be available one third of the year because I was on planes to and from the venue, the other two thirds. Now I can do stuff every day. I recorded a podcast with two digital government leaders three hours ago, and now I'm doing this. And so there is a glut of talent. And I think there's also a rise of the importance of the moderator. Like most of the calls I'm getting are not people saying, hey, Alistair, can you give a talk? They're like, look, we know you can give a talk, could you also be the MC because you seem to have no shame and you seem to be able to get people to interact and crack jokes and have some surprises. They want that entertainment, right? If I could pick my perfect job description, I don't wake up in the morning. I have, those of you who know me know I have very little ambition. I just happily stumble into awesome things, but I don't wake up in the morning going, this is what I want. But if I had to pick, I would like to be the Seth Meyers 
of the intersection of technology and society. Like that'd be the perfect job, right? So I think that role of the, the moderator, the person that can tie it together and ask the important questions is, is really different. Um, and I think that your, the other stuff is the physical infrastructure, the staging and the uh, trusses and all that stuff goes away, but there's really a need for the virtual production the people who run do the run of show and like right now i don't have a voice in my ear saying hey um you know cut to camera three which we did at the start of Fest thing there's no technology out there to show a presenter this is the number of people you're talking to and how many of them are bored like i can see this right now but i don't have i'd like a thing that shows 400 little circles and then it shows how many of them i have the screen that are looking at their screen and you know some kind of sentiment like that there's no like presenter view there's a Zoom room and that's about it. So, so I think we have a long way to evolve to make that easy too. Uh, yes, the po post COVID, the salespeople are gonna want this back, you know? Uh, whether the salespeople get it back is another question entirely. Uh, I think that we may see the end of the single uh, purpose business trip. So like I'm going to California for a week to see 14 people mm -hmm. as opposed to I'm going for this meeting. I think that'll change for sure. So there's a couple of people here I haven't heard from, Marsha and Sherry. Hi. Hi. Uh, Sherry, where are you at? I'm in Toronto. So I am in a weird spot where I manage for clients. So that experience is vastly different than the content that I'm creating. So um, we're, I create events that, um, that I control and I curate and all the things that are being said are exactly what um, I actually live and breathe. The hardest thing is, is that on the corporate side, I have groups that still want to create the, um, the traditional event experience and then just migrate it online. So getting them to sort of change that brain when they're in a, we're already in a group think, and this is what we've always done is part of the, the challenge that I have. Yeah, I think we loved the idea of having people captive. Right. You've yeah. flown to my city, you're in my trade show room, so you got to stay here. Right. And that was a credible disservice. That was like a trap. Yeah. If the content's not good, go away. And if the content's good, more of that. Yeah. Like I've been thinking a lot about uh, at Startup Fest, we do this thing where <clears throat> when people speak afterwards, we give them a picnic basket and they go like 20 people come up with questions. Nothing makes me happier than like Harley Finkelstein, you know, CEO of Shopify. <clears throat> people have questions for him. I turn around and Harley's having a picnic with 20 people on the lawn. Yeah. And those people are like, I'm getting to have lunch with the COO of Shopify. That's pretty cool, right? In the modern world of web things, there's no way to say, let's do the after talk. Let's have the speaker go off and follow up with people. But we need that, right? So I think that, you know, we're, we're destroying the things that were good and we're sticking with the things that were lousy. I remember I saw this VR trade show thing and I'm like, you choose a room in the auditorium and then you see the screen. I'm like, wh why is there a bad seat? Like literally there's places to sit where there's like column in the way. And I'm like, I, why? Um, and I think it's nostalgia. I think we have this technical nostalgia for it. Yeah. And I think people just don't actually, they can't think to break the model. So they get so stuck in what the model looks like that they, they it doesn't matter what the vehicle is. But I have people that are, that are talking about platforms as venues. Right. They can't even change the language. So there's yep. lots of things that are that are. Well, we changed. Different. We change. We're changing our stuff to uh, to channels. So instead yeah. of stages, it's channels because you're in channel one, channel two. Um, yeah. But I do think that something that I've used with some success to convince people is just this analogy. Yeah. You're like, here's the thing. This is what changed. This is what's now. Your job is to figure out what's in the bottom right corner. And yeah. there's no way to ignore that, right? Like, do you want to be a music store? All right, well, I also use the analogy that when my clients say it should be so much cheaper to do digital and I'm like, well, live TV is actually pretty expensive to do if you try to do it. So trying to get them to break that too, or reallocate budget. So the right. budget. And should from a sponsor point of view, um, you know, the sponsor actually gets much better tracking. They know who attended it. So yeah. I talked to one company that raised their prices for digital because they found that the leads they were giving people were so much more qualified. Yeah, it was only 300 people that attended your session on virtualization, but they came to a session on virtualization. You know what to sell them, right? 
And I think that level of visibility and tracking, we have to change the perception that if you're here for leads or for education, can you do some kind of certification? Whereas if you were at a trade show before, you didn't really have any of that. Uh, Marsha, you've been quiet, but you keep wringing your hands and looking upset and making faces at the screen. So tell us how you're really feeling. And where are you? I do not have a poker face, that's for sure. Uh, I am actually outside of Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, nice. And uh, I, I haven't gotten used to it yet. So uh, oddly enough, about a year, a little over a year ago, I began the process of moving from Austin, Texas, uh, where I'd only had been there a little time. Also, uh, I shared that just because I've actually been a professional public speaker for most of my adult life. I'm usually the person who's brought in at the, oddly enough, and I'm the last speaker here, that wasn't intentional. Uh, I'm usually the click closing speaker simply because the, what I have to say is that time is short and we have to all be working our asses off at improving the world because it's going to hell. <laughs> I say that in different language, but that's pretty much the gist of it. <laughs> and so it's, it, it, I'm in the position to say, here's the reason, here's the evidence, here's the, what you can do about it. And here's how, no matter what you do in the world, it's up to you to help pitch in and be able to get us through. And so that's always, you know, conference people always appreciate that being the closing message. And I was an executive at Microsoft. I was an executive at PeopleSoft. I have a, I, I've worked in the CIA commission. I, I, have, I have a lot of heavy duty credentials to bring to this conversation. And yet I find that um, I, I haven't, the, the, why this event, I'm so glad that Gina invited, to me, invited me to this is so hilarious to me is that I haven't thought about public speaking in three years. I haven't thought, I've, I've gone, I've had to leave the country a couple of times to go speak at conferences where people have brought me in, but I haven't done this. So I'm so excited to even think about the opportunity we all have in front of us to be able to move the ball down the field, to be able to actually improve the world. Uh, from our desks, wherever that desk may be. So thank you. You've given me a ton of ideas. I, I started a new company this summer, and I will, based on this thinking, maybe I should get back to speaking publicly. Well, Marsha, I will say that you. if your book says connect, collaborate, and work, That's and right. I have a slide that literally says collaborate, <laughs> communication, and content, um, this is, by the way, another advantage. I can go stalk Marsha while she's talking and go, oh, my God, look at the things you've done. Um, the reality is that all of us are adapting our our expertise. Years ago, I spent some time with O'Reilly talking about what publishing would become. And the line I came up with is that the role of a publisher, and I think this is more and more true in the modern world, the role of a publisher is to let people claim, develop, share, and monetize an idea. Like that's a very simple definition of a publisher. I want you to claim an idea. This is your idea. Could be a tweet could be a full-time job, I don't know. Then I want you to let, let you develop it, which means I'm gonna get it in front of people, I'm gonna have editors, I'm gonna work on streamlining it. Then I want to share it, because I'm gonna get it in front of the world now that I've developed it a bit, and monetize it, whether that's public speaking or books or whatever. And I think that the medium we choose that happens to be, like for books, linear, analog, you know, sequential, structured, but there's no reason it has to be like that. And we have been lazy as people who think for a living using the default narrative model of a linear slide deck or a book. And there are so many other things we can do from Oxford debates to choose your own adventures to whatever. We just have to start thinking about them. We just have to tell ourselves, this is not bad. I can be Spotify or Netflix or whatever. And so Marsha, looking at your background, like I tried to make, I knew this was gonna be a chance for us to chat, but I wanted to like do it by example since it's about online events, which is why we did a bunch of silly activities we went through and hopefully we all learned something today as, as you know, the kids on South Park would say. But for all of us, what's that idea that we claimed that we develop and then how do we adapt it to this new model? I could have made an online treasure hunt with a bunch of fake websites that you had to go find to get to the point where you were doing this. I didn't do it, but I could. Like there's a, I'm going to show you something now because I like to always show people this. I always like to end with something interesting. I'm going to show you all something really cool. Um, this is a piece of software. Um, and I hope I can find it. And here we go. So this is a piece of software I wrote with my daughter when she was about eight. David, you're going to love this. Um, this uses a piece of software called Ink. 
there's a famous uh, game called, a video game called Around the World in 80 Days, or 80 Days, that talks about Around the World in 80 Days, and it's a choose your own adventure kind of game, and it has things in it for inventory and for, you know, different stuff you might want. So we're in a large cave, and there are paths left and right. I'm going to increase this a bit. Um, so in this cave, I'm going to go left. Oh, I'm in a large chamber, a gentle glow leaks in the room, whatever, and I can go back. Oh, there's spooky sounds. I'm going to go back to the entrance. Oh, okay, I'm going to go right. Now this room is full of yokai. I'm going to try and catch one. I managed to catch one, and I continue on to the next. So I have this companion, but I don't, I don't want to keep going because I'm going to get eaten. So I'm going to go back to left, and then I'm going to listen to the whispers, and the whispers say, always choose red. Then I search the room, and then I press the red button. Oh, look, now um, I've got a mysterious gold key, so I'm going to go back to the entrance. This time I'm going to go right. Once I've gone right, I'm going to uh, search the room again. I ignore them, and I'm going to press on because I've got a yokai. And then I'm going to unlock. Uh, I use my little yokai, which saves me. And then I unlock things. I try to catch a dragon. Do I put my piles in a coin? Do I want to catch a dragon? Oh, no. None of them wants to be caught, but they scratch my face and I died. That was horrible. So my daughter and I made this little game, and it took us maybe an hour. And it uses a piece of software called Ink. Uh, it's called the Ink Programming Language. And uh, it's by a company called Inkle. And it's very, very simple to write. Um, and basically, you have the code and the thing on the right. And it exports as a JSON file, which you can put online in, on any website. It is ridiculously simple. Why are we building blog posts when we can make interactive adventures that teach people stuff? Why do we start a session without saying to people, do some work to prove you've earned it? Because once they've proven they've earned it, then they're going to get involved. They're going to be engaged. I think we are being lazy. I think that the, the state of event technology has made us all compliant. I'm 50 years old. I'm exhausted. I would much rather just get on planes, travel business class, give talks, and get fat in hotel rooms. But that's not what the world's like. And I think that the future of events is realizing that we can reinvent things, that we are at the kind of moment that gave birth to a Spotify or a Netflix. And it's our chance to use these kinds of simple technologies, some of the ones I've showed you today, some of the ones I'm sure you're going to go discover, to create awesome experiences that people will pay money for and people will feel are a good use of their time, rather than showing up out of some kind of guilty conscience to try and make their friends feel better, which is why most of us watch our friends on Instagram. Gina, you're laughing a lot too. Are, are you just watching my Instagram videos to make me feel better, Gina? All right, Laurent, we went past the end there, but yeah, I'm funny looking. Um, Laurent, thank you for organizing this. I hope this was useful to everyone. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can bug me at, uh, at a Kroll. I'm pretty prolific on Twitter. Uh, it's great to see all of you. At some point, I will take these many slide decks and put them into one slide deck. Uh, yeah, Kim, Inkle would be amazing for your kids' uh, programs because you can build these really fun, very simple to use branching narratives. It actually does things like inventory. You notice I had a key, so it remembers that you have the key and then you can find out if you have it later and so on. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so thanks for joining. Uh, any other?